All right. Thank each one of you for coming tonight. We uh, didn't plan it this way, but the weather planned it for us. So we didn't have a choice but to do it this way. We already see the clouds coming in and uh, by tomorrow when we were supposed to try to have it, it's not going to be good weather, they're saying. So we uh, run it up to tonight and I appreciate each one of you for coming. Appreciate our neighbors, all of our neighbors that are watching us also and joining us tonight. And appreciate you folks, all of you. Thank you for being here. We're going to start with a drama that some of our young people put on, so I'm just going to give it to them, and I'm going to get out of the way, and they're going to worship the Lord with you here.
Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. As we uh, celebrate this season, this time of year, of course, yesterday, we call it Good Friday. And uh, many people say, many scholars say that yesterday was crucifixion, but if yesterday was crucifixion, tonight can't be resurrection. And I'll show you in the Word of God. Crucifixion happened before yesterday because Jesus said, and I'm going to read it to you a little later in the night probably. Jesus said, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Three days and three nights. You can't do that from Friday to Saturday night because early Sunday morning he was already alive. He had already resurrected. But he was required, according to his statement and the word, to be in the grave for 72 hours. So, no matter what day it was, we had a Savior that died for us. But today, folks, we are, if we were literally there, we are a few hours from the greatest victory that's ever been won. And he won it. Jesus won it, not for himself. He won it for all of us right here tonight. Hallelujah. He beat death, defied hell and the devil. And today, he sits at the right hand of the throne of God. I love him tonight. I love him. And I believe you love him. That's the reason you're even listening and you're here tonight. We love him. And we're thankful for the price that he paid for us. As we uh, we're going to do our service a little bit different tonight. I'm asking Adam if he would to come on and, and get ready to uh, speak for us. And then... We're going to kind of mix it up along the way. We uh, got two or three more speakers, so we're going to mix it up along the way with some praise and worship and some ministry into Word as well. But are you ready for a great night? Come on, are we ready for a great night? Yes. Now, this is not just something to have that we can say we had church. When we leave here this evening, we want to know we've been in the presence of God. Amen. We want to know for sure that we met with God and God met with us because that's what it's all about, folks. So come on, Adam, minister at this time. Pastor has asked me if I would just take a few minutes and talk about um, biblical concept of resurrection. So, what do we what do we mean when we talk about that? Um, I want to start by talking about apologetics. I love uh, to read about apologetics. Apologetics is the the discipline of theology that deals with um, defending the faith, showing that the claims of Christianity are sensible, true, can be defended. Um, and deconstructing other worldviews and other religious claims. Um, there's a number of ways that you can do that, all right? A number of ways that you can defend the faith. You can talk about the Bible, talk about how the Bible's reliable. It's a, um, it's a true historical witness uh, to what's happened in the past. Uh, it makes sense of the world. Uh, its claims are reflected in the world in rea uh, in, around us um, and in reality. You can... Uh, compare and contrast other religions in the world, compare Christianity to the claims of um, the other major religions. You can make philosophical arguments about um, the existence of God, but it's become fashionable uh, in the past few decades, uh, and I think 
rightly, um, to drive people um, to the question of did the resurrection happen or did the resurrection not happen? That that is our starting point. Centering our argument on the question of did Jesus get up from the dead? Uh, it's interesting, if you look at the historical situation of when Jesus lived, um, there were a lot of other messianic figures. There were a lot of other people who came along and said, I'm the Messiah. I'm the one who's going to usher in the kingdom. And these were Grandma, uh, um, Mama Smith gave me a, a book on Josephus uh, a few months ago. Josephus was a Jewish historian who lived about 40 years after the time of Christ. Uh, and Josephus tells us that there were dozens of these false messiahs who, who came along and would amass disciples. Um, they would have their own gospel message that they would preach and they would travel throughout the countryside much like Jesus did. Uh, so, and often, uh, very often, they would also uh, get themselves into trouble with the temple authorities and would end up crucified by the Romans. So what is it that sets Jesus apart uh, from these other Messiah figures? What sets him apart is that the messages of all these other false messiahs died with them. If Jesus is alive, then his message is also alive. The difference is Easter. The difference is the resurrection. Uh, Gary Habermas, who's a, a New Testament scholar, I like to read, he, he says that if the resurrection is true, then everything in your life has to change. If the resurrection is true, everything in your life has to change. So I want to just talk uh, three quick ways that the resurrection does, in fact, change our lives. Number one, the resurrection means that Christ's words are true. His words are true. Uh, I have a lot of books. Some might say too many. Um, I really love to read. Reading is just the stuff of my life. It's how I like to spend my time. Uh, but there's only one person in my entire library that I read who rightly predicted their own death, burial, and resurrection. All right? Um, there's only one person who managed to pull that off. So when I read other books, um, I read quite a few, I read them critically, right? I'm standing over the text that I'm reading, and I'm deciding whether or not I agree or disagree with what I'm reading. I read skeptically through a critical lens. When I read the scriptures, when I read the words of Jesus, the words of the risen one, I always have a posture, I hope, I always have a posture of submission. Because anyone who can predict their own death and resurrection and then deliver on it, I'm going to take whatever else they have to say as gospel truth, and I'm going to shape my life accordingly. Resurrection shows us that we can build our lives on His Word. Number two, Christ's death and resurrection saves. His death and His resurrection saves. Uh, often, in our conversations about, about the cross and about um, the death of Jesus, we consider that our salvation was won for us just in the crucifixion of Jesus. Uh, and that's true as far as it goes, but it's, of course, only half the story. That's not where the Gospels end. You read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They don't end with Jesus being buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. The story goes on. A story without a resurrection is a story that doesn't end well for any of us. Um, it's in the resurrection that we see that our sins have been swallowed up in the death of Christ. And that Christ has defeated the dark powers that held us captive. The resurrection is the announcement that a way has been found through sin and death. It's interesting that um, Jesus doesn't go around death. He doesn't go over it. He goes through it, and he defeats it from the inside. And that for us is an invitation that we can follow him in confidence into death, knowing that death does not have the final victory, that there is a resurrection that we can expect and hope for. And that's, in fact, um, what the picture of baptism is. It's this picture of us going down with Christ into the waters of death and emerging 
from those deathly waters into a life of resurrection glory that we share with Christ. Number three, Christ's resurrection fuels our mission. Uh, one of the things that God's doing in the resurrection of Jesus is He's showing us the plans that He has for the whole world. That's why Romans 8 talks about how the whole earth is groaning for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed. Why is that? Because every molecule of God's creation, every tree, every river, every rock, every distant planet, every star, millions of light years from the earth that's collapsing in on itself right now. All of that is going to be covered in resurrection glory. Everything that is in this moment right now as we speak, and this is something that we need to remember in the middle of um, a pandemic, everything that is subject to death and decay will be remade in Christ's image. The resurrection is the inbreaking of new creation into the present age. And when we follow in obedience to Christ, that's the power that we are taking part in to remake the world in the image of God. So the resurrection shows us that His words are true and we can trust them. It shows us the way that He has accomplished our salvation by entering into death ahead of us and conquering it from the inside. And it shows us the global mission to take the resurrection of Jesus to the world. To take that resurrection glory that clothed Christ when he stepped outside of the tomb and to take it into every dark place in the world that we can find. Because he lived.
Aren't you glad he's alive? Life would be, I think, unbearable if we had no hope of a resurrection. But because he lives, that lets us know we will live after death. We're going to live forever, folks. We just quit being a part of this society and start being a part of another society, but we're going to live forever. And that's what's wonderful, because he lives. We have a hope beyond anything that this world can imagine, and I'm thankful for that tonight. John? Praise the Lord. What a privilege to just stand before God's presence tonight and just be able to proclaim his word and speak his word, his truth. It's such a privilege tonight. I want to speak to you for the next few minutes on just something that the Lord laid on my heart during when I was uh, during my time of devotion one day when I was sitting in my office, and that is wisdom and prudence of the holy kind. There's wisdom and prudence that are buried in this world that we live in. There's a worldly kind of wisdom and prudence. There's a godly kind of wisdom and prudence. Some of those things we gain through time, through trials and learning, through wisdom and prudence. But his word, his holy word, I believe, is the truth because I believe he lives. Speaking, if you want to turn with me your Bibles, you can. Proverbs 8, chapter 4. Reading in Proverbs 8 and 4, it says this. Let's just back up. Let's go, let's go to verse 1. And this is what this is speaking about in this particular chapter. It's speaking about wisdom is better than rubies. There's some things in this life, as you've heard the, you've heard the, the quote just like I have, there's some things that money cannot buy. There's some things that are more valuable than any amount of money or things you could ever hope for or want for, amen? But it says here, and then starting with verse one, it says, do it not wisdom cry and understanding put forth her voice. She standeth in the top of the high places by the way in the places of the paths. She crieth at the gates and at the entry city, at the coming in at the doors. Listen to what it says in verse four. I want you to get this now tonight. I want, you to, I want you to listen to what this has to say. This is for you and me. It's just as relevant back then as it was today when it was written back then. It's just as relevant today. It says this, Unto you, O men, I call. My voice is to who? The sons of man. That's you and me today. It's just as relevant to today as it was back then. He says, sons of man. What did they call Jesus when he was here? Oh, son of man. <coughs> we shared something very relevant right then and right there. <coughs> when he said, you and I would be called what? Sons of man. We share something in, very personable, very important there when he calls the sons of man. But he says unto you, O men. The emphasis when he says you, O men, he's speaking to you and I. But look on in what it says in, in verses 12 through 14. This is what it says in the same chapter. And it, this, is, this is something else that I wanted to speak on to on prudence. Prudence is something that's defined as what? It's a carefulness. It's a cautionness. Thank you. But it says in verse 12, dealing with what it says, wisdom dwells with prudence. 
Two things is powerful together, wisdom and prudence. As I've read a book one time called The Power Twins, you know, it, it, these two things, they just, they bond together to form one. But it says here, he says, I wisdom dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way, and the forward mouth do I hate. It says on, it says, counsel is mine, and sound wisdom I am understanding. I have strength. It says, by me kings reign, princes decree justice, by me princes rule, and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. But I love what it says there, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, arrogancy, evil ways. The forward mouth do I hate. There's a lot of things that's being thrown around today. As far as saying, listen to what I have to say, listen to the wisdom that I have, listen, listen, this is prudence, this is where you need to go, this is what you need to be doing. But what we all need to do is be listening to what said the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Could you agree with that? If we follow his word, and this is timely, folks, in the time that we're living in right here and right now, wisdom and prudence, more important than it's ever been today, that you follow him, you listen to him. There's a lot of things we can listen to. There's a lot of winds of conversation going on, especially in America right now, with the things that are happening within our society. And we see so many precious souls and deaths and then things going on, so much illness. There's a lot of things that can pull you away from what's important. That's the wisdom of God. That's prudence. Going on at what it says, and, and, and I heard someone the other day, they said, there's two things you need to do every day. Very simple. He said, the speaker I heard, he said, he said, two things, very simple. You need to fear God every day. What is fear of God? Reverence all of him. He said also, you need to enjoy your day as much as you can while you're here on this planet. Make, make the most of it that we can. <clears throat> it's, it's, it's tough right now for a lot of people. It's tough to understand what's going on. It's hard to understand why this would be allowed. But with wisdom and prudence, as we listen to God, and we fight through this thing, and we stand together, and we stand with God, the one who lives, We'll make it through this. Psalms 49 and 1. Let's look there and look at what it says. Psalms chapter 49, verse 1. It talks about this. America, it says, to trust not in riches. America, one of the wealthiest countries on the planet. We've been blessed so much to sow out into other people's lives. We've been so blessed to sow into other countries with missionaries, with funds, with re relief efforts. And now it seems like the whole world is in need. But listen to me tonight. If you're trusting in something that's earthly, and Scripture talks about where moth and dust doeth corrupt, that, that says to us that, you know, the things that we, we think we place so much value in here up on this earth and we waste so much time on, <clears throat> it's going to pass it away. Does God want us to enjoy things while we're here? Sure he does. It's in scripture. It's, bi it's Bible. And we're going to enjoy it in the afterlife too. When we got die, go to heaven, the new earth's formed and everything, the new city of Jerusalem, we're going to enjoy all those things with him in his presence. But it says here to not trust in riches. It says in verse 1, Hear this, all you people, give ear all ye inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor, together. My mouth shall speak what? He says, of wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall be what? Of understanding. He says, I will incline mine ear to a parable. I will open my dark saying unto the heart. Wherefore should I hear fear in the days of evil when the iniquity of my heels shall compass me about? Listen to what he says there. He says, my mouth shall speak what? Wisdom, the meditation of, of the heart shall be what? Understanding. Understanding, carefulness, prudence. That's what God is speaking to each one of us here tonight. Wisdom and prudence to follow him. 
Don't trust what you see going on in the world around you. Don't let it drag us down, destroy our confidence in, in the, the God that lives tonight, that Jesus does. He lives. He's alive. But let's go on and read. <clears throat> In Proverbs, let's go back to Proverbs chapter 8 where we started. And let's look at what it says again. Starting with <clears throat> verse 32 through 36. This particular passage speaks on what? Refusing not instruction. What is it that our pastor's been telling us for such a long, long time? What's he been teaching on? The same thing this passage speaks on. It's what God's trying to tell us. He's trying to tell all the churches. You listen to a lot of different pastors. He's trying to say to each and every one of us tonight, pay attention. Listen to what I'm trying to do right now. Listen to what I'm trying to say to the country. Listen to what I'm trying to say to families. Families that are closed off together in homes together where they're having to spend time together with each other whether they want to or not. <laughs> they're at, we're having to. But thank God that I've got my children home. They're all home together. We're spending time together. It's like having a long Christmas break together. You know, and a great time together to, to see each other, to talk to each other every day, spend time together. But listen to what he says here and refusing not instruction. He says in verse 32, Now therefore hearken unto me, O ye children, for blessed are they that keep my ways. Hear instruction. Be wise. Refuse it not. Because he says, Blessed is the man that heareth me. Think about, think about the scene in your mind, if you can, as many movies as have been made about it through times, the crucifixion of Christ, the weeping, the crying, and then the arrogancy of other people that were just there just to watch, to see the crucifixion of these so-called criminals. Think about what was going on, what was happening there, and, and, and as people watched and listened, one side just there to mock and just to spend an afternoon to seeing something that would absolutely turn some of our stomachs to watch. Something we would hate to see is, is, is seeing someone have to be, a, you know, a capital murder scene, something that's not per pretty to have to watch a life taken. But reasonably so sometimes Lives are taken for capital punishment. But there was one that hung there that deserved it not. And thank God he's alive today. He's Jesus, alive. our Savior. He's alive. But I love, it, what, I love what it says. If you read on in this passage about, you know, uh, about Wisdom's Banquet in chapter 9, we could go on and on. <clears throat> But it says, and in closing, I need to get there, Second, First Timothy chapter 2. Let's look there and see what it says. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. This is Paul, as he, he gives an exhortation. He says, to, this, this is the type of prayers we should pray for all men. He says, I exalt, exalt exhort, rather, therefore, that first of all, supplications prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men. Amen. Amen. How many of you have cried out lately for those families that have lost those precious souls? How many of us have prayed and said to God in, his, in Jesus' name, I curse. I curse this plague that's come upon Hamilton or Red Bay, wherever you live, I curse it in Jesus' name. I curse the sickness that has come against the state of Alabama in the United States of America. We come against it. We pray for these precious people that have lost these precious loved ones. How many have cried out lately 
as it says here, like in 2 Timothy, and giving prayers for all men. He goes on, he says, even for kings and for all that are all, all who are what? In authority. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus, He's the mediator right now for you and I. Praise the Lord. Thank God for it. Thank God for what he did for us. But it says, <clears throat> it goes on and it says, Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time? Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ, and I lie not. For I am a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. In other words, he, he recognized, he, he wanted to emphasize, yes, I'm speaking this even unto the Gentiles, people, that through Jesus Christ, it's the truth that they can receive him, that they're covered. It says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. Amen? Amen. You believe that tonight? I do, and I, I, folks, I tell you, this is the time for wisdom and prudence to be practiced and to be applied for me and for all of us. I, I was thinking about a song. If there's any song that I think about at this time, there's a song called There's Room at the Cross. Anybody remember that? I remember that old song. I looked it up. I had to find the lyrics and what it says. And it says in the lyrics simply this. The cross upon which Jesus died is your shelter in which we can hide. And it's grace so free is sufficient for me. And deep is its fountain, as wide as the sea. The chorus goes like this, there's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come. There's still room for war. There is room at the cross for you. Though millions have found him a friend and have turned from the sins that they have sinned, the Savior still waits to open the gates and welcome a sinner before it's too late. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. You believe that tonight? I do, and I say, I, I say tonight, thank you, Jesus, for what you did for me. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did for all of us. Though you didn't have to do it, though God sent his only begotten son, hallelujah. Thank the Lord tonight for wisdom and prudence. Pastor Smith.
didn't know what to do with you, honey. Didn't know what to do with it. All right. Um, I'm going to speak real briefly tonight. Um, generally, when, when I'm going to speak, I, I spend the week writing down stuff, and then Saturday, Saturday night, I'll put it all together. Uh, but I didn't get that option this week, so bear with me, and I'm going to just try to, to do it as we go. Um, but how many know how important this weekend is? Without this weekend and what we celebrate, there wouldn't be a Christmas. There, there wouldn't be churches. We wouldn't have Bibles. Our faith and our Christianity is based on this event. Without it, we have nothing. But I feel many times as I look between Christians today and the disciples of the Bible, we look very different. And I'm going to just touch on a couple of things that I think we struggle with today. Number one, we have to buy in 100%. I was listening to the radio this week, and I heard something that, that I had actually said myself before, but it came from someone with a unique perspective. And I'm going to pull up this, this person real quick. Does anybody know who Charles Colson is? How many history buffs have we got? We got a few. Uh, he's most well known for being special counsel to Richard Nixon during 69 and 1970. He was known as the Hatchet Man. He gained notoriety in the height of the Watergate scandal for being named as one of the Watergate Seven and pleaded guilty to obstruction of justice and attempting to defame Pentagon Papers. He actually served time in Maxwell Prison in the state of Alabama, about seven months. It was either right before he went to prison or right as he was going to prison, he gave his life to Christ. And he actually said something that, that gives a unique perspective. He said, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How, you may say, because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead and then proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denied. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world that, at that time. They couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me that 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible, he said. So think about that. How many of you have had to try to keep a secret? The more people you tell, the more likely that secret will get out. It's just going to happen. You tell one, they tell two, and before you know it, everybody knows about it. The other thing is, think about if you're involved in something that you're not supposed to be in, and there's people, other people involved in that. You see it all the time on, on police dramas. They get one, and then they flip it, and, and then they talk. They get, get them to tell everything that happened on everybody else. The more pressure that's put on, the more that you do not believe in what's going on, you're going to tell. It's going to happen. The only way to endure that type of pressure is you're bought in 100%. There's no other way. They went from hiding. They were in hiding after his crucifixion. It was over. It was done. The disciples were scattered. They went from that to spending the next 40 years devoting their lives to the gospel. It cannot happen if it is not true. I think about so many times, in times of despair, people run back to God. 9-11, after 9-11, the churches were full. We didn't have enough churches to fit the people in. But 10 years later, there's empty buildings. Why? Because they have had, not had that encounter that they needed, that they were bought in. 100%. It's the only way. 
Number two, we have to protect our lives of communication. We have to be listening to what God is saying. Too often, God gives us something and we run with it. But then we don't get other instruction. And so we, we continue on down that path, but we're not getting instructions, further instructions of what we need to do. If you think about in battle, that's the first thing many times that the enemy tries to do is cut the lines of communication. Because they know once that's done, then they can move in and do what they need to do. Too many times that happens to us. I was watching uh, a movie this week, War Room, and it's one of my favorite movies. And if you hadn't seen it, um, a lady had put her house up to sell and a realtor had come in and was talking to her about the house and she was showing the house to her. But the lady that was selling the house was more interested in talking about God. And the lady, the realtor, she was just wanting to get information on the house and, and the lady just kept pressuring her about her faith. And she asked her, well, are you on fire? And she said, well, I wouldn't really say that, but I'm not cold. You know, we, we, we go to church, but you know, we, we have other things going on. Well, the lady made the realtor some coffee. And as she drank it, she, she made that face and she said, wow, she said, I didn't realize that you liked your coffee room temperature. She said, I don't, mine's hot. That goes to many times where our life is. We're not hot, we're not cold, we're somewhere in the middle. And we're allowing our lines of communication to God to be severed and we're not getting what we need from Him. It's, a, it's amazing to me that we have the technology that we do in today's times, but we fail to reach this world for Christ as the disciples did. Why? Because we don't have that line of communication with Christ. It was said that Mother Teresa, and she said this herself, had one true encounter with God. Early in her life, she had a true encounter with God. And she said it was the only true encounter that she had. But look at what she was able to accomplish from one encounter. What could we do as a church if we had that type of encounter with God? If we want to reach the world, not just the world, but our communities and our families, it's going to take that type of encounter with us.
He paid the ultimate price for every one of us. The Hensons sang a song, produced a song, wrote a song, I suppose. Said, lock me up in a prison, throw away the key. Deprive me of the food I eat, even bind my hands and feet. But as long as I know Jesus, I can still go free. Thank God we're free tonight. Thank God for our country. We live in a country of freedom. And I know we feel like we have been kind of shut in for the last few weeks and don't have the freedom. But thank God for the freedom that we have in our country. But more than that, thank God for the freedom we have in Jesus Christ. And I believe it was Paul in the Bible said, talked about if in this life only we have hope in God, we'd be of all men most miserable. But folks, our hope goes beyond this natural realm that we're in now, beyond the natural body. Hallelujah. There was a resurrection and there will be another resurrection. Hallelujah. He became the first fruits, it says, of those that slept. But I want to tell you, before long, and I believe that it is before long, there's going to be a major resurrection, and the people of God are going home to be with Him eternally, to enjoy the beauty of the Lord, to enjoy the place that He's prepared. I love what He said in John, I believe it was chapter 14. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Hallelujah. Jesus is living in a wonderful place tonight. If we want to picture him in heaven, that's true. The Bible said he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. But he don't just live there through his spirit. Where does he live? In us, inside of us, the literal Spirit and power of God brings Christ into our lives. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Praise God. He is alive. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to go to the Word of God for a short time tonight. I'm going to tell you, you've heard some wonderful sharing from the Word of God tonight. So I'm only going to go for a short time and we're going to come back and they're going to do our closing song. I'm not going to read the entire story. We know the resurrection story. Uh, and that's what we're celebrating. We have gone through the crucifixion. We understand the price that was paid. And if you read Matthew chapter 27, you'll find out the excruciating pain, suffering, abuse that our Lord and Savior went through. And he did it for us. He did everything that he was doing, he did it for us. He didn't do it for himself. He left heaven, came to earth, and took on humanity so he would know how we feel. He would know all about our pains, our sufferings. He would understand us because he was one of us. It's hard to uh, tell someone that you know how they feel when you've never been there and a lot of times when we we are visiting with someone and someone has you know has suffered they've they've lost someone maybe and we say oh i feel for you i i know how you feel if you don't know how they feel unless you've been there 
But that's the reason that Jesus took on humanity, took on flesh, so he would know how we feel. When he said, I know how you feel, he knew full well how we felt. If you read the story of crucifixion, and I'm going to omit that, but if you read the story of crucifixion in Matthew chapter 27, you'll find where Jesus stood before uh, Pilate. Pilate wanted to, in his, in his own way, he said he wanted to release him. I'm not sure that that was really his full desire. You know, a leader is supposed to be able to do, in his position, is supposed to be able to do what he knew was right. So if he's saying, I don't find anything wrong with this man, I find nothing worthy of death, but you turn him over to a mob to kill him, you can wash your hands, and that's what he did. He took him a, a pan of water and washed his hands, said, I, I, my hand, I'm clear, I'm clean of this man, this innocent man. I'm not going to have anything to do with it. You just had something to do with it. He turned him over to a mob to have him crucified. But before he turned him over to the mob, what is so, what is so strange about Pilate's uh, way of doing this is that he said, I don't find any fault in him. I, I, he's an innocent man, so I don't find any fault with him. But he said, but I'm going to scourge him. And if you understand what scourging was in the time that Jesus was living at that time at the hands of the Romans and of different ones. The scourging was something that the Bible historians say that many people, many strong men died at that point. They never got tied. The whipping post, they called it, where they were tied to a post. And a strong man, a strong soldier, one of their strongest, would take a whip with close to a dozen prongs on it. They would tie broken bones, broken glass, anything that would tear the flesh off of the person that they was about to use that on. And they, would, they were allowed to do, they did have 40, but they reduced it. They were allowed to do 39 times, striking 39 times. And if you look at 39 times 12, you're going to see a large number of gashes in the body, the back, even the face. They, they stripped them down, tied them to a post, and deliberately beat them until many of them would die right there. You know, the, Jesus could not die there. Now, it, it weakened him in his fleshly body to the extent that when they put the cross on him to carry it to Golgotha, he would fall beneath the weight of that cross because his body had lost so much blood and he took such a fierce beating that he would fall. But Jesus couldn't die at that whipping post. If he had, he could not have fulfilled the prophecy that he was supposed to have fulfilled and that was that he would have to die the death of a cross. And the cross at that time was the most cruel death that they could find to, to kill the most cruel death that they could find for a criminal. And of course we have an innocent man here, Jesus, but it was the most cruel death. But he had already, you know, we, we just sang, I will cherish the old rugged cross. Much of what he did for us he did it before he ever got to the cross. The cross is, is, as I said, the most cruel death that you could die because you, you lose, you suffocate, really, is what happens. You, 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 you pull up with you, and it wasn't in his hands. It was in, just in the, behind the palm of his hand where they would drive it in, and that nerve that would go down and through that body. So you try to pull yourself up where you could breathe and push up with your feet and your feet one on top of the other where the spike drove through them. And you, you can only stand that pain for so long until you have to let back down and hang on your arms and then you begin to lose your, 
ability to breathe again because it's closing out on you and you have to pull back up again and they they have said that there has been some that would hang there for possible days criminals that would hang there for days but the lord had to go to the cross to fulfill prophecy but he didn't have to hang there for days if you read this story finally it seemed that literally god had turned away from him he could not look at the pain the suffering and what was going on he could not look why could he not look at that because while jesus was hanging there he took on every sin that could ever be committed every gross thing against God he took it then on himself and God cannot look at sin and condone sin in any way now his son was taking all the sins of the whole world on him and so the father would turn away from him temporarily this is in the book in Matthew chapter 27 you can read it and Jesus would seem to look up and say my God my God why have you forsaken me you've turned away from me he could feel that the father was no longer he was having to carry every bit of it on his own he took the full weight of sin and everything but before he got there he took those stripes for what that we could be healed every disease every sickness every affliction could be wiped out through the stripes because Isaiah would prophesy and with his stripes we are healed Peter gave a revelation of what he saw and he said with his stripes you were healed so he knew that Jesus did that but as Jesus hung there finished everything that was to be finished the Bible said he gave up the ghost he released himself from it in a sense we say they killed him and that is in a sense true but yet they couldn't kill him they didn't have the power to kill him he laid his life down and he literally gave up the ghost he forfeited his life that we could have life i am come that they might have life saint john chapter 10 verse 10 and that they might have it more abundantly that was crucifixion and that was the flogging the abusive beating that he received on that cross as he said it is finished he finished it in time and gave up the ghost that they would not break his legs because isaiah had already prophesied there would not be one broken bone not one broken bone they came to the first man, they broke his legs, so he could no longer push up. That meant he would suffocate. They came to the other and they broke his legs to do the same. They came to Jesus and they marveled that the man's already dead. He suffered and gave everything for us, but he had to fulfill all prophecy or he would not be the Christ. You see, there was three crosses that day. In fact, if you do thorough reading, there was five crosses that day, or at least five people that was crucified that day. We only find, and we say, well, there's only three, but read it real carefully. Read it, dig through it, read it real carefully, because the book said that two of them railed on him, one on one side, one on the other railed on him, accusing him and going on. But there was another two, and the Bible says that one of them started to accuse him, the other stopped him, and he said, listen, man, me and you are here because of our deed. This man's done nothing amiss. He said, Lord, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus looked over at him, and he said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So there was possibly five crosses on that hill that day and if Jesus had not fulfilled the prophecy of the Word of God he would have been just another man that died on the cross that day but he fulfilled all prophecy 
But you know what? They put those other four in a grave, like they took Jesus' body down and put it in a grave. And that might have been, and we say Friday, but Sunday's coming, but it wasn't Friday. I beg to, to differ because I'll take the word of God that where Jesus said. How many will take what Jesus said above anything else? Jesus said as Jonas, and you can read that, and I won't take all the time, but you can read that in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. Jesus said as Jonah was in the belly of the, the whale for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth three days, three days, three days and three nights. You can't get three days from Friday to Saturday night in the night or early Sunday morning. So you got to back it up and look at it. It's a scripture, scripture standpoint. I, tried, I started trying to, to picture this out and I went to all the, you know, all the maps you got in your Bible. But there's also many different other things that are in there as well. And I started to try to do some research at exactly what time and all and it said he died on Friday. And I said, no, he didn't die on Friday. And I'm not arguing with the, with the, with the book. But, but this, the Bible is the word of God. But many of the things, the added parts in there, somebody put it in there. Say, well, it's in the Bible, but it's not in from Genesis to Revelation. It's extra that somebody put in there later. But I'm telling you, Sunday was coming. Amen. Sunday was coming, and I, I would like to go to, and we're going to close here, but I would like to go to Luke chapter uh, 24, if it's still light enough for me to read. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in and found not. But all of you say not? Found not. Now if they'd have found the body, we'd have been in trouble. Some, one of you said earlier. We would be in trouble if they'd have found a body that was in there. But it said they found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. My personal feeling, my personal view, is that's the greatest words that have ever been uttered for Christianity. We read John 3:16 and how great that is. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But when those ladies came to the tomb that morning, very early in the morning, and the angel said, why seek ye the, the living among the dead? He's not here, he's risen. That sealed Christianity, hallelujah. He not only had the power to lay his life down, he had the power to take it up again. Praise God. Aren't you thankful for the resurrection? We celebrate the birth of Christ as Christmas time and how beautiful that is that a Savior would come. But I want to tell you something. If he had just come and had not finished it, do you know what the ridicule on the cross while he was on the cross and they said, if you be the Son of God, come down. You, you, you've saved others, let's see you save yourself. It was to do their best to force humiliation on the Lord that he would succumb to say, prove himself. I can prove to you I'm the Christ. He didn't have to prove to them he was a Christ. He knew he was the Christ. Hallelujah. He'd been in heaven with the Father, took on the form of man. He knew who he was, so he refused. The devil wanted everything in the world to trick God out of getting his plan completed, but he didn't make it. Hallelujah. In three days, Jesus stood victorious over death, hell, and the grave, had the keys of death and hell in his hand, and said, I want it for you. I want it for you. I give it to you now. I'm going to give you life. All you got to do is come and take of the water of life freely. Thank God for the resurrection. And we're about to close, but I want to thank all of you. And um, 
I don't know how, we don't know how long this thing's gonna last. We don't know. I think we're getting close to where we're gonna be liberated. But if it's not by next, next Sunday, look for us again and we'll be doing it this way again. We're gonna close out with our theme song here. Where could I go but to the Lord? Aren't you thankful for Jesus? Aren't you thankful for Jesus? Hallelujah. Where could I go but to the Lord? Thank all of our neighbors for joining us again tonight and all of our people and visitors who come to be a part tonight. God bless you so much. We love you. In time of crisis, there's nowhere you'll find real peace. It's an old song that says, the only real peace that I have, dear Lord, is in you. The only real peace you'll ever find is in Jesus Christ. Where could I go? Where could I go? saved tonight. Aren't you glad you're saved? Yes. Hallelujah. A brand new creature in Christ Jesus. All things passed away and behold all things are become new. God bless all of you. Have a beautiful Easter. 
we call it Resurrection Sunday. Have a beautiful yes. day. Have a beautiful week. Have the greatest week you've ever had. Trust the Lord through the good times. And when the times don't look the best, still trust the Lord because He can make it the best. He can turn situations, circumstances, and cause so much good to come out of it, you stand in awe and say, how could that happen? But it happens because of him. We love you. God bless you. Good night.